Elizabeth Cheney is the former Republican member of Congress from the state of Wyoming who distinguished herself during her service with courage, honesty, and an absolute dedication to the preservation of the Constitution of the United States. Because she stood against the tide, because she said no in a sea of cowardice, Congresswoman Cheney was awarded at the Kennedy Library the Profiles in Courage Award. She was awarded the Profiles in Courage Award because in a time of abdication, in a time of faithlessness, in a time of cynicism and cowardice, Liz Cheney said, I stand with America, not with Donald Trump, and not with a gang that is trying for their own sake, for their own power, for their own benefit, attempting to take as much as they can get. What Liz Cheney understood, maybe in part because she is the daughter of a man who conceded an election to President Jimmy Carter from President Ford, who had lost his voice in the final days of the campaign, because maybe she had been with her father when he received word that Senator Kerry had conceded an election, or that Vice President Gore had conceded one of the closest elections in American history, she understood that the greatest invention in American history was the peaceful transition of power. She understood that the cornerstone, the keystone of American society and life is that peaceful transition of power. Liz Cheney didn't just pass by the painting in the Capitol that showed George Washington surrendering his commission back to the Congress, the man who could be king, an emperor, a Napoleon, instead bowing, subordinating himself to an idea that in America, it is the country, it is the republic, it is our liberty, that is supreme. Washington's humility in that moment made possible the creation of the United States, the birth of the federal republic that came from the constitution, which has endured for over 200 years and made America the oldest constitutional republic in the world. Liz Cheney, because she held firm and fast, was drummed out of Kevin McCarthy's Congress. Liz Cheney was a truth teller, and there can be no room for a truth teller in a sea of liars. The truth teller makes the liar uncomfortable and shamed. And so Liz Cheney couldn't stay. Liz Cheney had to go, replaced by the most transparently cynical woman in the Congress who would have been a perfect pair for her fellow New Yorker, George Santos, Elise Stefanik, an equal fraud in everything except the invention of the particulars of her resume. Like the children screaming in praise of Hamas, she went to Harvard. No surprises there. Congresswoman Cheney has written a book. And in that book, she details the behind the scenes, private moments that took place as Donald Trump tried to overthrow the Constitution of the United States. In order to truly appreciate what these conversations must have been like, you have to know Liz Cheney. Trust me when I tell you this, they were extraordinary. Liz Cheney is an unflappable person, and her looks can be priceless. And I'm trying to imagine the look on her face when Kevin McCarthy looked her in the eye and said, Donald Trump was depressed. He wasn't eating. He was so sad in Mar-a-Lago, stripped of power, disgraced. The man who was president, who attacked his own country, 
a man so brittle, so small, that he refused to accept the judgment of the American people. And so it was that he slinked back to Mar-a-Lago, humiliated and disgraced. In fact, he lacked the basic dignity to attend President Biden's inaugural. A low, shameful, and despotic man. The greatest scumbag America has ever produced. But that sad man needed a hug and needed to be uplifted. So Kevin McCarthy went to Mar-a-Lago. And that's really where you have to start to appreciate the legacy of Henry Kissinger. Because Kevin McCarthy going to hug on Donald Trump in Mar-a-Lago was not unprecedented. There was another person in American life, though much smarter than Kevin McCarthy, much more glib and much more celebrated by the media who he so easily manipulated, Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger found himself on his knees embracing Richard Nixon on one of the last nights of his presidency. Nixon had asked Henry Kissinger to pray with him. And so they got down on their knees together and they held each other in front of the portraits of the presidents. That was the price for Henry Kissinger of power as he stood in the Oval Office and listened to Richard Nixon's anti-Semitic slurs. What Henry Kissinger did, above all other things in his life, was extend the war in Vietnam and sentence thousands and thousands and thousands of young Americans to their deaths, like pawns on a chessboard. Henry Kissinger was a Jewish refugee whose family escaped the fate that awaited millions of German Jews by the luck of months. His family was able to make it to America before the Kristallnacht. Henry Kissinger would reach the heights of political power. He was a deceitful and dishonest man and well known as such. He manipulated people and he did it like a maestro. And for that, he rose and rose and rose to the heights of political power. And when he was done with the heights of political power, he cashed in. And for 50 years, he took the money from the Arab despots, from the Chinese, from companies all over the world. And so when it came to be after September 11th, when it was Henry Kissinger nominated by George W. Bush to lead the commission understanding what happened on 9-11, he didn't last very long because he refused to disclose all of his contacts, all of the money he was making, all of his conflicts of interest. What Henry Kissinger was, was a game player. He viewed the world as his chessboard and he found himself in position to move the pieces. Do you want to know what Henry Kissinger's legacy is? Here's his legacy in Iran. And here's his legacy at the southern border, the legacy of interference in the affairs of South America, the chaos that it spawned over two generations. Here's his legacy in Cambodia, where he enlarged the war and never understood the deep implications of what happened in Cambodia as a result. But Henry Kissinger never looked at those Cambodian lives as equal to an American life. They were pawns in the game. And the genocide came. This was called real politic by Henry Kissinger and his admirers. But Henry Kissinger, whose lifetime spanned the first quarter of the 21st century and three quarters of the 20th, never picked up on the absolute lesson of the 20th century. 
That lesson was delivered in a valedictory speech in 1999 by Elie Wiesel in the White House. And the speech was a condemnation of indifference. It was the capstone of the lessons of a century that saw more than 100 million people killed in wars. And now, a quarter way through the 21st century, an indifference to morality, an indifference to decency, has led us to a place where we have forgotten the moral lessons of the 20th century. Henry Kissinger's life was devoted to the concept that power was its own end and its own absolute, like water in a glass, expirable. But that's not true. Power should be used for the promotion of humanity's decency and benefit and goodness. The United States is a moral nation because it's founded on moral ideas. When the United States falls short, it is not a reflection on the morality of those ideas, but rather the immorality or amorality of men who run the government, men like Henry Kissinger. There will be much written about Henry Kissinger's genius. But when you think about his genius, think about the wall, the black one, carved with the names of 58,000 Americans who died in a war that the American government knew could never be won from the very beginning. Lyndon Johnson bears responsibility for that. And Robert McNamara bears responsibility for that. Richard Nixon bears responsibility for that. And Henry Kissinger bears responsibility for that. And it's not forgivable. Not even if you live to be 100 years old. Because when you raise your hand and you take the oath, your responsibility is to the nation. And there is no higher higher responsibility than to the nation's parents and to their children who would put on the uniform because they believe in the nation's leaders and go off to fight in a foreign land because they believe in the principles that they are told are necessary to defend. The men who ask such things of our young men from the factories and the farms who don't have the privileges of a Harvard education, don't have the good fortune to be discovered and to be seen for maybe their brilliance. The dignity of their lives was snuffed out in a faraway jungle because of the cynicism of middle-aged men and old men, men like Henry Kissinger. He spent a lifetime being celebrated, being lionized, being toasted. Well, he made a lot of money. He held a lot of power. And he killed a lot of people. That's Henry Kissinger's legacy. It's not one any American should be particularly proud of. Being smart is not a virtue. Being decent is. And when you achieve great power in the United States of America, you will be judged in the end. And now his judgment has come. And his judgment in history's eyes, deservedly so, will be most unkind. 